Hello, my name is Omar Awan, and I'm an Associate Professor of Radiology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Today I'd like to talk about my approach and evaluation of MRI examination of the ankle. I usually start by looking at the sagittal images through the ankle on a T2 fat sat weighted image, and the first thing I look for is I evaluate the marrow. I evaluate the marrow signal intensity on a T2 fat sat to see if there's any marrow edema. So I start and I pretty much go through all the different osseous structures. I start here with the fibula. The fibula look good. I look at the tibia. Notice that there's no marrow edema. It all looks, the marrow looks nice and dark as it's satted out. The fat is all satted out. And then I turn to the talus. And if you take a look here, there is some minimal patchy marrow edema here along the lateral process of the talus here. A little bit here, maybe at the tail or neck. Uh, but it's very faint and subtle. But there is some minimal T2 hyperintensive marrow edema, but the rest of the talus looks good. I turn to the calcaneus. This here is a calcaneal tuberosity. This is the calcaneal body. This here is the anterior process of the calcaneus. It all looks, uh, the marrow looks preserved. The cuboid looks great. The navicular, we're going to come back to the navicular, but the navicular, as you can see, there's an os navicularis and there's marrow edema within this os, and there's some minimal marrow edema along the median eminence of the navicular. We'll come back to that on the axials, but notice that there is some marrow edema involving the navicular. The cuneiform bones, the medial, middle, and lateral cuneiforms look okay. The cuboid looks good. And then you always want to look at the base of the fifth metatarsal. You can have fractures. You can have inversion injuries along the base of the fifth metatarsal, and you can get a avulsion of the lateral cord of the plantar fascia or the pronius brevis as it inserts onto the base of the fifth metatarsal. But you also want to look at the fourth, third, second, and first metatarsal. You just want to make sure that there's no marrow edema. You want to corroborate this as well on a T1 weighted image to make sure there's no hypointense fracture line that you may have missed on the T2 fat sat image. But notice again that we don't see any you know, fracture deformity here. You also want to look at a T1 because it's the most important sequence to evaluate for marrow proliferative or marrow replacing processes. If the marrow signal is iso intense or darker than muscle, then you'd be concerned about a marrow replacing process such as tumor or infection or something of that nature. But notice that the marrow is nice and fatty, as we'd expect. And there are no major issues with the marrow here on the T1-weighted image. I also want to, since we're on the sagittal, I want to point your attention to the sinus tarsi, which is this structure right here, or this space right here. Uh, there should be nice fat coursing through the sinus tarsi, because if, there's not, if the fat is replaced, then you would consider the possibility of a sinus tarsi syndrome. And a lot of times that fat can be replaced secondary to a ganglion cyst, a mass, or fibrosis. There's a lot of structures that run through the sinus tarsi that uh, I want to briefly mention. Those are the medial, lateral, and intermediate roots of the inferior extensor retinaculum. That's some of the structures that you're seeing here, these hypointense bands. The cervical ligament also runs through the sinus tarsi. And then also the talocalcaneal interosseous ligament that you're seeing right here also runs through the sinus tarsi. So there's a lot of structures that run through the sinus tarsi here. Okay. Coming back to the sagittal uh, T2 fat set, you also want to take a look and see if there's a joint effusion, the tibiotalar joint here. This is just physiologic fluid within the tibiotalar joint. There's nothing that's extending the joint. You can also look for a subtalar effusion, uh, which we don't really see here. And, you know, effusions along all of the different joints that you see along the hind foot, mid foot, and even the proximal forefoot. Other important structures to evaluate on the sagittal image is the Achilles tendon, which is this hypointense band right here inserting onto the calcaneal tuberosity. Most tears uh, occur two to six centimeters from the insertion onto the calcaneal tuberosity, so right about at this level here, notice that there's no tear here. There's not even tendinosis here, so if the AP diameter of the tendon was more than eight millimeters or there was a convex anterior border to the tendon with intermediate signal, you would suggest the possibility of Achilles tendinosis, but this is a pretty normal appearing Achilles tendon. There is some trace fluid here. This is called the retrocalcaneal bursa. Okay. Um, you can have retrocalcaneal bursitis that occurs. This is Kager's fat pad. Notice that there's no infiltration of Kager's fat here. The other structure I want to point out to you on the sagittal image is this hypotense structure that's inserting onto the plantar calcaneus, and that's the plantar fascia or the plantar aponeurosis. People who have plantar fasciitis will have thickening and perifascial edema about the plantar fascia. Usually we allow up to four millimeters. If the plantar aponeurosis or the plantar fascia is greater than four millimeters, that suggests the diagnosis of plantar fasciitis, especially if there's perifascial edema. And just to show you 
on the coronal image, there's actually three different chords of the plantar fascia. There's the medial cord of the plantar fascia, the central cord, which is this dark hypointense structure, and then the lateral cord of the plantar fascia. Okay, The central cord is the most important for maintaining the longitudinal arch of the excuse me, it's the most important for stability of the plantar fascia. And the medial cord abuts the abductor hallucis muscle, the central cord abuts the flexor digitorum brevis muscle, and the lateral cord abuts the abductor digiti minimi muscle right here. Okay, So that's the plantar fascia. And we're going to look at the coronals here just to see if there's any significant marrow edema. We're going to go to the axials and look at that as well. We can also see here that there's edema along the osteonavicularis that we'll get to on the axials because I think it's better seen on the axials. But the coronals are also good to see if there's any osteochondral injuries or osteochondral defects along the Taylor Dome. The Taylor Dome is a common place to get osteochondral defects or osteochondral injuries, um, but we see none of those here along the medial or lateral Taylor Dome. And an osteochondral defect is exactly like its name implies. It's a defect or an injury to the underlying bone and the cartilage. Okay, so we don't see any of that, but I mainly come to the coronals mainly to look at a couple structures. One is a deltoid ligament, which is right here medially between the medial malleolus, uh, and it has a superficial and deep component to the ligament. The superficial component can be thought of as a tibiotalar, tibiocalcaneal, tibionavicular, and tibiospring components. Okay, this here is the tibiospring component. It's continuous with a superior medial branch of the spring ligament. The spring ligament is made up of three components, a superior medial, the medial plantar oblique, and the inferior plantar longitudinal components. You don't see all of those on MR. Sometimes you can see some of them on an axial image. Let me see if I can show you the other ones. They're very hard to see, but they kind of run in this area right here. The medial plantar oblique runs here, and the inferior plantar longitudinal ligament of the spring ligament runs right here. They're very hard to see. But the superior medial aspect of the spring ligament, which is right here, is very well seen on the coronal image. Okay, And then there's a deeper component of, to the deltoid ligament, which involves the anterior and posterior tibiotalar uh, branches of the deltoid ligament. You're allowed to have normal striations, as you're seeing here. This is a normal appearance of the deltoid ligament. You're looking for you know, T2 hyperintense edema or discontinuity about the ligament to suggest tearing, and you're looking for marked thickening to suggest chronic sprain of the ligament. Okay, so that's the that's the dominant medial stabilizer here that we're seeing, the deltoid ligament. And then laterally, there is about five ligaments we look at. We look at the anterior and posterior tibiofibular ligaments, which are the syndesmotic ligaments, the anterior and posterior talofibular ligaments, and the calcaneofibular ligament. I want to draw your attention particularly to the calcaneofibular ligament, which is this ligament right here running between the fibula and the calcaneus, because I think it's best seen on the coronal view, and it's not well seen on the sagittal or the axial view, although sometimes we can see it on the axial, but I feel like it's best seen here on the coronal view. Okay, You're also seeing part of the talofibular ligament running between the fibula and the talus right here. Okay, But we'll see that on the axial view. But you know the deltoid ligament and I think the calcaneofibular ligament are best seen really on the coronal view. You're seeing part of the extensor digitorum brevis muscle right here. This is the quadratus plantae muscle here. You're seeing part of the tarsal tunnel right here, which is where the posterior tibial neurovascular bundle runs. Um, and that's those are the structures that I mainly look for on the coronal view. I look to look at the proton density coronal image as well, just to evaluate the articular cartilage, make sure there's no osteochondral injury along the Taylor dome here. Another beautiful look at the deltoid ligament here that's allowed to have normal striations. This is part of the spring ligament that we're seeing right here. Just to corroborate some of the findings that you saw on the coronal T2 fat sat weighted image. And then after that, I turn to the axial images. This is the axial T2 fat sat weighted image. And I want to finish the ligamentous structure. So we talked about the deltoid ligament. We talked about the calcaneofibular ligament. But there's four ligaments in the lateral aspect of the ankle that we should look at. So if we start here along the most superior strike, this superior uh, slice, this is the interosseous membrane right here between the distal tibia and fibula at the level of the tibiofibular syndesmosis. As I come down, the first hypointense structure coursing between the tibia and the fibula here, these are the syndesmotic ligaments. This is the anterior tibiofibular ligament. This is the posterior tibiofibular ligament right here. Okay, These are normal structures right here. Nice hypointense structures. Minimal striations along the posterior tibiofibular ligament, totally normal. 
Okay, you're looking for a break or discontinuity or mark T2 hyperantis test edema to suggest a tear. As I course more inferiorly, you're going to see this sort of comma-shaped hypointense structure okay, between the talus and the fibula. That's the anterior talofibular ligament. It's normal in this case. It's the most commonly torn ligament in the ankle status post-injury, particularly inversion injuries. And it, there's T2 hyperintense edema or discontinuity of the tendon. A lot of people have chronic sprains and it gets chronically thickened. This is the anterior talofibular ligament. This is the posterior talofibular ligament. Again, this posterior talofibular ligament can have striations within and that's within normal limits. And then the calcaneofibular ligament it is usually deep to the peroneal tendons. These are the peroneal tendons right here. It's usually deep to it, but again, it's very hard to see, I think, on the axial images. I showed it to you on the coronal images. So those are the lateral ligaments. They're the anterior and posterior tibiofibular ligaments, the anterior and posterior talofibular ligaments, and then the calcaneofibular ligament that I showed you on the uh, coronal view. And then the deltoid ligament is the major ligament within the medial compartment of the ankle. So those are the ligamentous structures in the ankle. I want to also point your attention now to the tendons of the of the of the ankle. We already talked about the Achilles tendon, which is right here posteriorly. It's made from the uh, medial and lateral gastrocnemius muscle and tendon units as well as the uh, soleus. They all converge to form the Achilles tendon which inserts onto the calcaneal tuberosity. This was normal. Okay, um, there's eight other tendons that you should evaluate on an ankle. There's three anterior extensor tendons. Okay, there's three posterior flexor tendons and there's two lateral peroneal tendons. The best mnemonic to evaluate the anterior extensor tendons are Tom hates Dick or tibialis anterior Accessor hallucis longus, accessor digitorum longus. This fourth tendon right here is an accessory tendon. This is called the peroneus tertius tendon. It usually originates along the anterior aspect of the distal fibula and it starts onto the dorsal base of the fifth metatarsal. You can see it right here. It's going to go all the way right there to the dorsal base of the fifth metatarsal. Okay? The tibialis anterior inserts onto the medial cuneiform of the base of the first metatarsal, as you see right there. Okay? The accessor hallucis longus will go to the great toe, and the accessor digitorum longus will go to the second through fifth digits. Notice that there's no thickening of any of these tendons. There's no distension of the fluid sh tendon sheath to suggest tenosynovitis. Okay, these are all normal tendons. So Tom hates Dick, tibialis anterior, accessor hallucis longus, accessor digitorum longus. The posterior flexor tendons are remembered by the mnemonic Tom, Dick, and Harry, or tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor hallucis longus. If we take a look here, the, the tibialis posterior will insert onto the navicular, the all the cuneiforms, and the base of the second through fourth metatarsals. Notice that there is minimal fluid around the tendon sheath and some thickening of the tibialis posterior, so there may be some mild tendinosis and tenosynovitis involving the tibialis posterior tendon. The flexor digitorum longus tendon remains normal. Okay, this here is the flexor hallucis longus tendon. There is some fluid around its sheath, but that can be normal because the flexor hallucis longus tendon communicates with the tibiotalar joint, just like the biceps tendon communicates with the glenohumeral joint within the shoulder. So you're allowed to have normal fluid around there. If it's excessive or out of proportion to the amount of fluid within the tibiotalar joint, then we call tenosynovitis. And the flexor hallucis longus goes to the great toe. The flexor digitorum longus goes to the second through fifth toe. So at some point, they're going to cross over, and that's known as a master knot of Henry, which is right here. Notice that the flexor hallucis longus crosses over and becomes more medial, and the flexor digitorum longus crosses over and becomes more lateral. That's called the master knot of Henry right there. Okay. And the two lateral tendons here are the proneus longus and the proneus brevis. The proneus longus is more lateral. The proneus brevis is more... Uh, medial, okay, the proneus longus is going to go and insert onto the base of the first metatarsal. You don't see its insertion right here, but you can see it on the coronal images. The proneus brevis is going to insert onto the base of the fifth metatarsal, as you see right here. Notice that there's no fluid within its tendon sheath to suggest tenosynovitis, and there are no tears here. The proneus brevis can commonly get torn right here along the proneal tubercle, okay, but notice that it's nice and normal here. I want to come back and talk about the os navicularis, which is right here. This is an accessory ossicle 
uh, that is usually seen within the distal tibialis posterior tendon. There's three types of os navicularis. There's a type 1, which is usually 2 to 3 millimeters in size. It's an ovoid structure that's usually within the distal tibialis posterior tendon. Then there's a type 2 os navicularis, which is what this is. It's usually 8 to 10 millimeters in size. It's usually ovoid shaped or heart shaped. It forms a synchondrosis or a cartilaginous articulation with the median eminence of the navicular. And this can be symptomatic, as in this case, because there's marrow edema around the os navicularis and the median eminence of the navicular. And there can be, you know, injury to the synchondrosis right here, which results in pain and, and symptoms for the patient. So this is a type 2 os navicularis in this patient with os navicularis syndrome. And a type 3 os navicularis is when this accessory type 2 um, ossicle fuses with the median eminence of the navicular and becomes a cornuate navicular or hypertrophied navicular here. So type 2s can become a type 3 after they fused with the median eminence of the navicular. Okay, so the rest of the marrow signal testing, aside from the marrow edema within the os navicularis and the median eminence of the navicular, the rest of the marrow edema looks pretty good. <coughs> Excuse me. You can actually also see part of the Lisfranc ligament, which runs here between the medial cuneiform and the base of the second metatarsal. This is hypointense band. It's made up of uh, a dorsal, a plantar, and interosseous component. It's made up of three different components. So that's the Lisfranc ligament, important for midfoot stability. Uh, the other structures I want to show you here, this is a tarsal tunnel right here between the flexor digitorum longus and flexor halsus longus tendons. The posterior tibial nerve artery and vein run in this area. You can have masses within the tarsal tunnel that impinge on the posterior tibial nerve, and that can result in symptoms. Okay, so you always want to look to see and make sure there are no masses within the tarsal tunnel. And then you also want to look at the T2 just to look at the muscular bulk here. Make sure that the, there's no T2 hyperintensity edema to suggest muscular contusion or, or strain. Okay, all the muscles here look very good. And then finally, what you want to do is you want to look at the proton density just to see what the muscle and the muscular bulk look like. Make sure you want to look at the marrow again. Make sure that the marrow is as you thought it was. This is the os navicularis, again, forming a, an articulation within the median eminence of the navicular here. Okay, and... That essentially is my approach to evaluate MRI of the ankle. We talked about the osseous structures, the cartilaginous structures, all of the tendons, the ligaments, the muscles, and the neurovascular structures. I hope that's given you an adequate review on what to look for when evaluating an MRI of the ankle. Thank you so much for your attention.